Hello and welcome back to a brand new episode of the Unsolved Podcast. As usual, I'm your host Santosh Venkatesh, and um, I'm very passionate about digital products. You know, apps we use daily on our phones, our tablets, and laptops. Right from ordering groceries at home to launching campaigns, email campaigns at work. I'm always fascinated and keep looking for the best app which can make my life easy. And uh, a big part of digital apps is to stay afloat by generating revenue. While most generate subscription revenue, a critical part is also advertising. And um, we encounter advertising, right? For example, if you open Swiggy and Zomato, we see a banner ad or a sponsored ad contextual to what we're trying to do or what we're trying to buy or order on the app. The same thing happens when we, let's say, fire up a OTT app, see a banner ad which tells us about the upcoming movie or a live event. Same thing happens on our smart TVs. So if advertising is so important for digital products, I was always intrigued about how this side of the business is managed. To talk about that, I have a very special guest today, Rudrish Kapoor, National Sales Director at Geo Ads. Uh, Rudrish, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for giving us your time. How are you doing? Thanks, Antosh. Firstly, I love the opportunity to come and talk to you. So, things are going good. You know, digital, as you know, keeps evolving uh, continuously. It's a, it, it's just a space where there's continuous explosions happening. Right? Mm-hmm. So, you are trying to uh, learn and also adapt. Right. So, that's that's what I'm up to. Fantastic. So, to start off, Rudrish, I'll um, can you help me and our audience understand your role in Geo Ads? Okay, so uh, to simply put it, I sell digital ads, right? I help uh, advertisers basically achieve some of their objectives, right? So uh, I work with different verticals, right? So I would work with, say, a handset client, uh, auto client. So I work across industries. And eventually, as you know, like the the digital landscape is continuing to fragment. Uh, It is about making advertisers understand where they can get maximum bang for their buck and hopefully with us. Right. Yeah, fantastic. So to continue the conversation, I'll start with a very uh, simple understanding of can you help us understand the distinction between selling a product, can be yeah. software or physically, versus selling a digital ad space. Top of our mind, the way which is I look at it is... Yeah. Uh, Digital ads or ads of any form used to be only to help people discover stuff. Yeah. But today it is not just that anymore. It is also at the bottom of the funnel. Where a traditional product probably, like you said, eloquently mm-hmm. said that it solves a particular function or achieves a particular outcome. That is where it is restricted. Yeah. It's more sort of a binary outcome oriented. Either you get this done or not. Yeah. This is so much more creative because uh, you not only help people discover n- new stuff, content, product, whatever it is, hmm. but also you reach them where they are ready to spend. Okay, so so the way I look at it, Santosh, is that uh, when you're selling a product, right, you're essentially looking at a customer need or want, right, and the customer is parting with some money, right, or yeah. some time, and trying to then experience a product and hopefully repeat that experience if they are happy with it, right? To my mind, uh, when you look at digital ad sales, right, every platform is not important mm. to every advertiser, right? Interesting. While while when you're buying a product which you need daily as a business or as an individual, you will continue to use that. You might switch brands, you might mm-hmm. look at, okay, which brand you know solves my current need better. Mm-hmm. You might evolve as a human being as well and then uh, you know, you might switch brands as you do that. But from a digital advertising point of view, mm-hmm. right, you have multiple objectives to achieve, mm-hmm. right? As a as a brand, when you're looking at what you want to do in a particular year, mm-hmm. right from, say, capturing the user's attention mm-hmm. to actually driving a sale, right? We mm-hmm. live in a society where currently there's a huge ag- attention deficit, okay? Mm-hmm. And people are everywhere, at all times, yeah. with a very limited attention span, Correct. right? So the, your content consumption yeah. has become very fragmented, Correct. right? It is not like in the earlier times people used to be on TV mm. or print, 
and you can catch them at a certain appointment, right? Yes. Today, people are just active 24-7, yeah. right? So, it's about capturing context mm. and where the brand fits correctly, right? Mm. And I think that is where the differentiation is, right? Fair. That it's very difficult for brands or even platforms for that matter to mm. know where the consumer will be at all times, right? And where they can actually be caught in the right context. So that ultimately leads to more business, right? And uh, I think that's the core difference fair. Uh, between the two. And that's fair. I think you touched on a very important point, the context. Yeah. Because um, while some of the so-called discoverable ads, yeah. let's say a brand or an address says, go take this ad to as many people as possible because my only aim is for them to realize that I exist. Yeah. Tell them yeah. there is such a product. But increasingly so, when we are looking at bottom of the funnel ads, where platforms, let's say, like Zomato or Swiggy, where people are ready to buy, in mm -hmm. the buy more, you can actually show ads which get converted and make people pay. Yeah. So context becomes very, very crucial and critical here. So how much attention is given to data on the side to understand user behavior? Understand content versus user behavior if it is a streaming app. Understand commerce versus user behavior if it is a e-commerce app. What do you think uh, is, uh, how important is that context and what data is looked at? I think I would like to start by uh, how brands actually used to plan earlier, right? Versus how they look at consumers now. That would be right? So imagine you are in a nation where there are say 10 crore people, mm -hmm. right? And you are launching a product which that category itself doesn't really exist, right? Say, in, let's take the example of say toothpaste in India maybe 50 years ago, mm -hmm. right? And uh, people had their own ways of oral hygiene, right. but toothpaste is like a new product which came into right. India, right? And at that point, as a brand, you just want people to know what you stand for, what function do you solve, mm -hmm. how do you solve it better than existing products, and then eventually you want to build some loyalty, right? So you create a base of say, maybe you capture say 10% of the 10 crore people and you have 1 crore people who latch onto your brand and are regular users. Mm -hmm. But then the unaddressed market is still 9 crores, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. by that time, you have caught attention of competition brands which have come in Correct. who want to take away your market share and then you grow the category mm -hmm. as the person who has, you know, come into that, right? Uh, and media plays a huge part in that because you have to... So, so 50 years ago, mm. you know, there are only so many places or touch points where you could reach a consumer, right? right? A potential consumer. Today, mm. it's a matter of you're spoiled for choice. But at the same time, it's very difficult to assess mm. which part of your marketing mix is actually working. Because I don't think, uh, you know, there are big chunks of categories which will now come into existence suddenly. Mm. It is more about, you know, the marketing tree suddenly bifurcating into multiple branches, right? So, uh, as of today, if I just take the toothpaste example, earlier it was just about something that protects your teeth, mm -hmm. right? Or keeps your teeth white. Right. Now it's about, do you have charcoal in your toothpaste? <laughs> now it's about, okay, you do brush your teeth, yeah. but, uh, you know, do you floss your teeth? Yeah. Uh, do you use mouthwash? So, multiple categories evolve from a big, you know, there are subcategories out of uh, big categories which evolve. And the context mm. for the communication of each of these categories is very different. Right. The people who will latch on to your communication are also very different, right? So, uh, let, let me take it like this, right? That uh, whenever there is a new generation which comes in, right? you always see the brands which your parents are using, right? right? And, but everybody wants to own their, yeah. okay, this is my brand, hai. this is my <laughs> brand and this is how, so you cool. know, I have evolved. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, I, it's, uh, it's part of human evolution, right? Yeah. On the brand side of it, if you look at it that way, that uh, people, and I always go back to the consumer being at the core of it, right? Mm. People's choices and needs evolve. Correct. People look at, uh, okay, this brand is for me and this brand is not for me. And it doesn't always have to do with the functional need which that brand is, uh, you know, fulfilling for you. So now coming back to how do you address this, right? 
uh, in the current way i think half the job is done if you have able if you have been able to capture the attention of a user right now the next part is how what do you do with that right now if you look at the traditional way of marketing the or communication right you would find that brands would create one tvc a big budget tvc you would bring in brand ambassadors you would talk about uh, how you know this is the best thing that has happened in the world to you right and uh, eventually you would just go crazy across mediums with that right but today's consumer doesn't want that today's consumer while at the core as a brand you will stand for something but the way in which you convey that has to be as per the medium correct right? so when you're talking on a social media platform when you're talking to a consumer on an ott platform yeah. versus when you're talking to a consumer say on a micro blogging platform all three cannot be talking the same say, right and this is where you also see d2c brands coming in and really you know shaking things up because they are questioning this age old status notion school. right that if i am a big brand yeah. and i i come with you know lineage i am talking about uh i'm talking about not just uh, the function need but yeah. also about how the customer feels when they utilize that product yeah, aspirational right? about it yeah. aspirational about it customer are not looking at it like that yeah. customers don't associate with only say pan india brand ambassadors <laughs> there are regional brand ambassadors which have bigger impact brands have been leveraging leveraging that brands also have been questioning do i even need brand ambassadors for that matter mm. do i or is my product the hero right uh, d2c brands keep coming in and also challenging uh, what bigger brands have been doing, right so you will find that uh, say even in the oral hygiene category or there are many such categories correct, but correct. since we have started with toothpaste let's continue with that <laughs> you would find that people who have been early adopters yeah. right for brands in the past will continue to adopt new brands as new things come into the market correct. right so from solving a very basic need of oral hygiene right to that gets evolved to okay is this product giving me uh, you know harmful stuff yeah. and you question the big big firms which are there that okay as a d2c brand i'm able to offer this at a certain Correct. price point why are you not able to right so so yeah it's it's a it's a big uh, there's a lot of dichotomy and yeah. irony in 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 all of this but at the bottom of it if i have to summarize mm -hmm. right uh, what worked say 5 years ago what worked today mm -hmm. i am let me not even mince my words in that right so <laughs> I, while while i started with the example of how things used to happen 50 years ago to now yeah. it's because there is a sharp contrast correct but now i think every 5 years things are rapidly evolving mm -hmm. now if we have to go deeper in this right if you take the example of uh, you know some brands will even question do i need to be a pan india brand just right so if you enter a category can i just own two markets can i can actually content and influencers drive growth for me can i not sell via ecom can i sell via my d2c <laughs> so these are questions which people are asking these are questions which brands and businesses are also implementing and you will find that with time mm -hmm. uh smaller d2c brands will start in some ways behaving like the bigger brand right. while your bigger brands and you know global right. brands will start becoming more agile right. to counter the d2c killer so in implementation how does that impact right uh, there are brands which say started off as uh purely online brands mm -hmm. right and today you are seeing them opening offline stores right while there are brands which have grown purely in india by means of distribution okay. the fact that they could reach the customer yes. at maximum number of points and simply because of that it's a matter of comfort and convenience right at the end of the day as a user so they sold in this scale but today their emphasis on is on okay how do i cut the middleman right. and i actually make more profit no, yeah. from my d2c platform yes. and the d2c platform started with that yeah. itself right that big companies have so much wastage and so Correct. much friction yes like if i can just go direct to consumer i can make more money so you'll yes. see this uh, melting pot Uh, you know, it's really come together, and 
eventually but i still feel uh, consumer needs and how you fulfill them most effectively will will uh, will take precedence i think one case in point about the last thing which you said about yeah. some companies who evolve from online only and to distribution plus online so yeah. who choose i just want to reach i want to distribute a recent story about nike yes is a fantastic uh, point where they wanted the d2c approach yeah right and the pandemic phase meant that people could not go out and they had to buy whatever they had to buy from nike online so that gave a false sense of understanding that all the attention of sales and everything has shifted to d2c and naturally who wouldn't want to capitalize absolutely yeah. absolutely which meant i read a piece on um, i don't know, market market daily on a platform which said that uh, they started nike started interviewing uh, existing distributors asking them please prove why i should give my products to you yeah. why you should send nike they had to pitch present most of them did some didn't now they understand that distribution is a very key aspect of reaching absolutely reaching so that's one and especially on the toothpaste point yeah i have a very uh, a personal story to say yeah. instagram we are all very active uh, we always used either dabber between dabber and pepsodent and patanjali or whatever i discovered perfora the brand that's Through, the brand i had in my mind yeah, yeah. So, on insta yeah i didn't buy i do my grocery shopping on big basket there it was sponsored ad yeah while i was about to buy toothpaste obviously it was very contextual i want to buy toothpaste and there it is perfora i tried and probably this is my third tube and i'm stuck with the perfora because i like i like it so yeah. it goes to show and also an extending point to this is before it used to be print medium newspaper television yeah so it used to be reach a household correct reach people now it is about reach the person because we carry our smartphones and tablets so you can literally reach people which may, which brings to the point that you have to understand your audience very deeply yeah so so there's a larger point there santosh yeah. right so uh i mean globally for any brand mm-hmm. or any major multinational right mm-hmm. india is not a market uh, now you definitely cannot ignore but even till 20 years ago right uh, you can you couldn't have ignored it right it is not a market you can stay out of right so china used to be that on the first stage and then india i think came into prominence yeah. uh, especially after i think the the changes in the economy in the early 90s uh and also fact of the matter is we are sitting on a population size of 140 mm-hmm. crores right so if you see uh, auto brands which entered india they invested with the promise that eventually all of these people would want to have the need for a car right yeah, okay. and even though today we are an economy which is bursting uh, with affluence and people's yeah, needs are evolving and all that still the household penetration of yeah. uh, you know four wheelers yeah. is still less than 10% in india yeah. so and you you will see this across categories right you will see it across say air conditioners consumer durables uh i think smartphones is the only category which has sort of uh, reached that kind of scale so but at the same time right everybody realized that indians pay for value mm-hmm. right indians don't just pay for everything right uh and this is a core difference between say a europe or a us right where people are willing to pay for uh subscriptions mm-hmm. in india people will always question that notion yes. right ki even if i have the money and it doesn't matter what affluence level i am at that doesn't mean my money is to be taken by a villain right <laughs> they have to justify they have to convince haggle and what not uh for me to part ways with my money and and this is true in india across economic strata right uh, this is not a case where uh, you can just you know go past this now coming back to brands right if you if you like you took the example of perfora you took the example of nike mm-hmm. uh and and nike is a great point right because uh, if you and i were in that situation and if you and i were thinking you know 5 years ago uh or maybe 4 years ago at that point how do we evolve as a company mm-hmm. i think most of us would have taken the pivot 
which Nike took. So Nike had to pivot, right? At mm. that point of time, I mean, many other brands did, right? Right from, uh, you know, you buying Amul milk to you buying, say, a luxury bag. I'm just covering. Correct. You know, people had different needs at that point. Uh, but every brand had to get into the right way to sell online, mm. right? And it's the scale of the pivot uh, uh, which which has changed now, right? So people today, as of today, you would also question why is Nike not on quick commerce? Mm. Right? I mean, they may or may not do it, right? Or brands like that may or may not do it. But it will definitely be questioned, right? Because if, if Apple can sell a product there, then why can't you sell a shoe there? Right? We didn't know this actually, that they're not really on quick commerce. So I, as far as I know, I don't think so. But... Look, the, the larger point being, right, that we, we come back to context for the consumer, right? And where it is convenient for that user to purchase, right? So, uh, since we are going with Nike, let's go with, say, sports shoes or a sportswear at leisure as a category, right? Now, are users available to you across digital platforms, right? People who are perhaps into fitness or who might be in the market to eventually buy a shoe or... Yes, 100%. But it's the context which matches, right? So now, if you take the example of Nike, Adidas, and so on, you will find that as a consumer, do you want to be hit by a communication from them when you're binging and checking out the show on, you know, OTD? Or is the context on a live cricket match much more relevant to you? Is it more relevant to you when you're ordering, say, a protein shake, uh, you know, as a, like a protein supplement? Okay. Or is it more relevant for you when you're ordering for, you know, stuff to make cocktails on blend? Yeah. Right? So, am I the same user who's yeah. available to you on all these platforms? But the context is different, right? So, and it comes back to that same point, right? You can't have one TVC, one communication, and just roll it out across platforms and, you know, you pray things will work out. Because there will be brands in your category who are more agile, who are actually treating every platform on what it means to that consumer. Correct. And is he or she or they, them, right? They are in the right mind space uh, to actually be attentive to your brand, right? Because... You, you look across platforms, right? Yeah. And you look at your own daily behavior. Mm. Uh, you will switch between, say, social apps. You would consume maybe short-term, short-form video. You would yeah. look at long-form content on YouTube. You would look at OTT TV. Mm. Uh, you might even check out a print, uh, you know, newspaper or something yeah, like that. Mm, but nice. a lot of times, uh, you are not open to communication from all categories. Mm. In fact, to my mind, Unless I'm conscious about it, I'm blind to ads. Like, so, the, the the point being that even though I sell ads for a living, right, it always comes back to where the user is, what are they looking for, and are you the right, placing the right communication in the right context. No. And I think that's the secret sauce. Easier said than done, though. No. Much easier said than done. Okay. On one point about uh, people's increasing ability to spend, yeah. you know, associating themselves with a brand because it sort of uh, depicts their lifestyle or the status. Um, is uh, Have you heard about this Rameshwaram Cafe? In Bangalore? Bangalore, yes. yeah. It's become a yeah. mage because the way they present the so-called fast food dashini type, it's a little upmarket. Yeah, yeah. I wouldn't go there. I have been there, but not at that price. Not uh, my cup of tea, but the amount of people, there are multiple locations in Bangalore, the amount of people who are willing to pay, which means, what does that tell us? It tells us that people want to associate, they want a better class of experience. Of course. Even if the product is the same. Yeah. The Igli dosa, coffee, tea, you can get anywhere. But why do we always go to third way? Yeah. When we can get at Starbucks or Chayus or Chai Point. So, this, if there is any time in India, to reach people who are willing to spend, it is now. Absolutely, absolutely. I think the uh, the phenomena which you are referring to and which a lot of brands are also trying to capture mm. right now is you're talking about premiumization, mm. right? Uh, so let me step back a little. Okay, now, and uh, look, I'm a patriot in that sense, right? That I'm extremely proud to be an Indian. Mm -hmm. So 
I think one phenomena which has happened over the past uh, 30 years mm-hmm. is that Indians don't look at themselves as any different mm-hmm. or in any way lower than any global citizen. Earlier, I think as a country, sometimes we have suffered from complexes, not necessarily of our own doing, but uh, it was a matter of exposure, right? Uh, With digital not being in place, say, 20 years ago, uh, how could you utilize something which you're just not aware of, right? You are scrambling for basic needs in a country where most of your population is uh, looking at, you know, living day to day. At that point of time, Brands coming in and showing you, you know, this is the good life uh, is also new to you, right? And it takes one or two generations uh, to really get into that space that, okay, now this is a normal way of life for me, right? So as of today, uh, I think the so from right from millennials to now Gen Z, uh, we may not save as much, but we are open to many more new experiences now, right? Because we feel that we are in a country where there is, you know, unlimited potential for growth. We feel that we are part of the global economy and not a subset of it. And we are a major player in that. So it all boils down to the mindset at the ground level, right? So as an Indian, you feel that it's not just about being able to afford, right? It's also about you know, one life, I'm, yeah. uh, I want to experience new things. So, take the example of, say, a uh, entry-level executive who was, uh, you know, say, joining a firm or public sector or a private sector company, uh, even 10 years ago versus now, mm-hmm. right? Of course, uh, they earn more, mm-hmm. right? They also spend more, mm-hmm. right? And they are spending on different things. Yeah. Uh, as the previous generation right, as now they are older, they are more self-dependent as well, right? They have had a uh, disposable income, real estate boom happening in India. So as a result, I feel, still feel that the older generation today, people who are say above 50s, are in a better space, less dependent on uh, uh, say the younger generation to take care of them. As a matter of principle and values, we still do, right? But is it always a necessity in every household may or may not be correct. So it all filters down to an Indian consumer who thinks like a global consumer who doesn't want to stay behind anyone. So right, if there is a new Nike sneaker dropping, Indians question why not India first? Right, we have the scale, we have the money, we have the ability to purchase, uh, then why not? Right. So I think that confidence as an Indian uh, is what really differentiates uh, people today and it doesn't just it's not an urban phenomena Correct. it's not something which is uh, like we are in Bangalore right now or it is not limited to the top 8 metros right. it has filtered down in fact in fact, it is more accentuated mm. in the next 10 to 20 bigger towns mm. in India mm. because if you look at it uh, and I think brands have also been a bit guilty in this, right? That whenever they have entered India, everybody started off with the promise of, okay, there are 100 crore people at that time, today 140 crore people. Uh, it's the biggest, uh, most populous nation in the world. But eventually they came here and realized that while it is true, maybe people only in these certain top eight metros can pay because the concentration of wealth was there, right? But today, that's not the case. Today, if you go even beyond the top eight metros, you cover the top 25 towns in India, uh, the wealth distribution and the kind of money people are willing to part with is significantly higher. And as a result, like coming back to the point which I was making earlier, right? D2C brands or homegrown brands operating in fewer markets actually will really challenge the status quo. Mm. You can't have one brand in India which will, you know, cover it all and solve every customer need anymore. That's true. So coming back to premiumization, right? Uh, that has been the case. You you take different categories, right? In, uh, say, if you take cars, for example, you could buy a premium German brand, mm-hmm. you know, a good vehicle, under 50 lakhs at some point. Pre-pandemic. Mm-hmm. Today, uh, 
the takers for you know a price point above one cr is unreal, and it's a growing. Uh, you know, it's a, it's more like an exploding part of uh, that that segment is actually an exploding part of the overall uh, you know auto industry, and at the same time, a first time buyer, uh, you know, in a car category, used to settle with okay, I'll buy you know the cheapest hatchback right. in the market. I, I don't want to spend more than this money. People are, first time buyers are buying, uh, you know, SUVs, mini SUVs worth 15 lakhs really, without blinking twice. Because people don't want to wait for the next five years. Well, uh, we are a generation of uh, instant gratification. or uh, so, so we want to experience life today. Right, and that is something you'll see across across uh, categories, even in smartphones, even in clothes. But at the same time, I feel in the future, and where brands are also playing, uh, thankfully, proactively well, is that it's not just about consumption. I think the previous generation was about consumption. Yes. Then future generations are about sustainability. So they're willing to pay a price for things, but the but it's not always about functional needs, right? It's about what the brand stands for. It's about uh, what the, I like to call companies profit centers, but <laughs> let's say what that company uh, stands for, right? Uh, are they taking initiatives which are beyond just, you know, delivering shareholder value? Yeah. So I think the future generations will, this will be a major part in their decision making process. Okay. Absolutely. But yeah, I mean, uh, I think going the other side of it yeah. is while there is this growing diaspora of people who are willing to spend, who are yeah. willing to associate themselves with uh, the premiumization of products and brands, there is still some kind of this proud Indianness where a, a personal example is this subscription thing while our parents' generation were restricted to newspapers and cable TV. Yeah. Um, or LPG. But today, water filters are available, furniture is available on rent. So, it so happened that a few years ago, I got this water filter on a subscription basis. My yeah. mother said, now we have to pay like the cable guy for water. Yes. <laughs> what is this nonsense? I can't stand it. To a level where even I might be comfortable with subscribing to a water filter, but I won't subscribe to furniture. And there are many platforms too. Absolutely. But there are specific use cases where you have to, where you temporarily have to live somewhere or if it is office furniture or whatever. But uh, at the same time, while I'm okay paying subscription fee for a water filter, I go to the salon very close uh, to my residence yeah. and they keep on trying to sell me their membership, yeah, which I don't want. Every time I tip the guy who cuts my hair 50 to 70 bucks because my haircut costs what, 250 bucks? I want him to have that money. Yeah. They say, if you buy this membership, 50% discount on every bill. I don't want that. I don't want to be tagged or tethered to some one particular place. Tomorrow, if I want to go somewhere else, I shouldn't be able to. So it represents, coming back to the point, yeah. understanding the context of where the audience is at that moment has become so critical. And it's also about mindset, right? The current uh, generation mindset and... I think uh, all of us marketeers or people who are also managing Gen Zs, right, you tend to want to understand where they're coming from, right? right? And it's all about commitment, mm -hmm. right? Uh, when you go to a salon, you're not committed in any way, right? If you move residences tomorrow, then in what are different in not, right? So uh, it's not about saving money there. Yeah. And like you, like you rightly said, right, that maybe directly giving money into the hands of the person who matters yeah. is uh, perhaps the right way because uh, you do wonder where your money goes. Right? But at the same time, taking the example of uh, renting furniture or subscribing to cars or subscribing to... That's a good idea. Uh, even though we, they all understand mm -hmm. that it's perhaps not the most frugal decision. Correct. Right? But it's also about having uh, the ability to choose and at your own will, on your own terms, and not be bound by anything, right? And uh, I think that is something which will continue to evolve, but we will still, uh, it will continue to evolve in a very Indian way. Yes. Right, because we will not pay for everything. The and there is there are some things where the heart rules over the head, and we pay a disproportionate amount of money. Yes. And it, but it, if you look at 
religion and marriages in india as a category right and the people who are involved in that you know many small businesses and uh, i think a huge chunk of indian population's livelihood depends on that but there we don't go back it on absolutely so so yeah that that irish yeah. will continue to exist yeah. and that's what makes us unique as india right. even across indications correct and also the volume harpo might be something which might save niche for netflixing yeah i'm not making much per person in india but you cannot ignore the volume yeah which means you have all types of consumers with all types of mindsets with all types of needs and wants and association so you if you want a customer you will find yeah, find in india in fact i'll i'll pivot into the ott space for that one okay. because if you look at uh, global platforms like mm-hmm. say on netflix right they they started off so us as an economy or as uh, the media consumer in us shifted drastically away from tv and print yeah. right and consumers evolved to the point that i don't want to wait for a certain program to come mm-hmm. at a certain time of the day i don't want it to be regulated i am an adult i can take a few swear words uh so i don't want uh, you know some somebody to tell me that i am supposed to consume filtered content yeah. right uh i want to watch things at my own time i want to have hopefully unlimited choice i want to try out new things why me sitting in us i cannot consume korean content correct so i think otts or say netflix i think was the lead in this that this solved for these consumer needs right but being a developed economy they were willing so tv itself was very expensive to have so it was a matter of shifting budgets of the consumer from tv so to say a netflix right data was not cheap in us but consumers still do that because they want to see content at their own time correct they want to choose be able to choose the the other side of this is that while you initially can subsidize it and you can you know build scale at the same time you're pumping insane amount of money into content creation yeah that is true insane amount of money which you can't just recover through subscriptions yeah and <clears throat> i used to have this debate mm-hmm. uh you know uh, with people i work with a lot that will netflix ever get into ad monetization and i can tell you even i was on the fence about this but the confidence which with with which people told me you know even though they had nothing to do with that company or this whole <laughs> ecosystem that they will never monetize yeah. my view always has been and uh, this has you know stay true across categories that when they enter india right they have to deal with india and bharat mm-hmm. right and that doesn't mean that bharat is cheap right we are value conscious correct we will look for what it solves for us right so there was this whole game about uh you know paid subscriptions versus people who will watch content free mm-hmm. and you will monetize them uh, monetize that through ads right and ultimately like you rightly mentioned uh, the game is arpu yeah. how much average revenue i am able to make for consumer who is coming and consuming content with me right so this got accelerated during the pandemic yeah. right because with the uh, content on tv not getting produced correct right. you know at the same speed and there were obviously bigger things to worry about at that point of time uh you would find that this adoption of digital platforms to consume content and consume quality content not just ugc right really accelerated mm. right and but so but at that point nobody was thinking about okay do we are we over investing in getting content uh, isn't it too much okay. uh, and and this hap- now now if if netflix or you know companies like that are sitting with say practically a whole pit of money mm-hmm. and they are plonking everything into this because they know they are disrupting a traditional business model mm-hmm. so they will go all in but what happens to traditional media companies during Correct. that time they also follow suit mm-hmm. right but luckily for them they still had a robust offline business right which continued to be cash cows and 
they continue to contribute to the bottom line yeah. so they could sort of subsidize it Correct. at the same time a lot of these companies were not uh, public mm. right so they didn't, didn't have the pressure to deliver shareholder value mm. now cut to today mm. cut to today everybody in this space is realizing that this is unsustainable mm. right uh you cannot just keep pumping money into creating content mm. and there is so much content that yes. if today i decide let's say that okay i am on a mission that whatever has been produced till today in the past 10 years i will just sit and consume that i'll do nothing else in my life mm. i might need a few lifetimes <laughs> to to get through everything uh so bottom line is consumers are spoiled for choice right and they will be very choosy in what they spend time on their attention okay. right it comes back to that so today you will find that uh, there will be a stabilizing point where i'm coming back to the point which i made at the very beginning right that your traditional companies will start behaving like your <laughs> right. uh, you know new age disruptors and your new age disruptors will sort of grow up have a few gray hair start <laughs> having like uh the the bigger established established company so yeah that's 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 something you'll continue to see in this space okay so and also this brings us to the point back yeah. to advertising where <coughs> brands and platforms yeah uh, have to be very mindful of not over stretching that as well i'll give you one example i yeah. follow this youtube channel called the friday checkout to the german guy he makes weekly videos about a couple of times about what's happening in tech. Okay. So yesterday's clip episode was about LG launching a new set of smart TVs at the price range of $3000. Okay. Now whenever somebody forces the TV or fit is lying IT, there'll be ads yeah. shown on. Yep. So Now I'm ready to pay $3000 for this TV. Why am I showing ads? Yeah. We had another guest Vivek Chennai shout out on a podcast for one of my clients he says i paid premium for my galaxy s23 yeah why is samsung showing me ads it's not that people are against consuming ads but yeah. in the right context by understanding the audience at the right time at the right place right. instagram is a fabulous example of discovering so many products yeah in fact to a level where on Inst- i don't know if people do this I have such deep OCD that I have created when I bookmark stuff. I have little channels for the products, for work-related products, for household-related products. If you meet a brand or a platform meets audience in this context, hmm. I think it seamlessly gets you know it merges with the content we consume on apps. I mean that is the sweet spot where all platforms and advertisers are trying to achieve. So. on that line yeah uh talking about big companies as like samsung and nike yeah and netflix big tech it is convention that 80% of ad dollars or ad money goes to google and meta okay where the rest of the 20% brands are trying to experiment and reach people in different contexts on different platforms yeah um the the evolution or the growth of digital products in india i'm talking about the indian context at all the 15 years ago we had 15 or 20 years ago india had no ott platform right and uh, flipkart didn't exist yeah amazon was not here but today from content to commerce you have so many apps so many platforms and people are willingly consuming even to quick commerce yeah yeah to a level so how do you see the digital advertising on all these platforms evolving versus competing with let's say google and meta in in the india context again i i tend to think of it from the the angle of the advertiser mm-hmm. right because i don't think it's digital or offline to them as much right so if you look at the overall size of the industry right depending on which report you read mm-hmm. uh maybe a 1 lakh crore overall ad spends in india right it, these are estimates obviously will go up and down mm-hmm. out of that comfortably you can say 35 to 40% of the spends are on digital right now if you cut to a few years ago there were a lot of uh, i would say digital denials right where uh, 
if you look, TV is huge in India. TV is established in India. TV and print, people know it works, right? It drives footfalls. It helps you reach a certain scale, mm-hmm. which was not possible earlier on digital, right? But as of today, I think we, uh, in the last, especially with the pandemic and the acceleration because of that, digital has actually gone past TV, mm-hmm. right? Again, depending on uh, which report you read yeah. and which people you listen to, you will find uh, that there is there are context and nuances to this. Uh, because there's the problem of measurement, right? People will talk about TV is an established universe. There is a start, there's a third party which governs and talks about measurement in that space, right? While on digital, while there is scale, no doubt. There are audiences and there is context, targeting, all that. Uh, there is not one common measurement agency or a third party, uh, you know, which governs the whole or regulates the whole ecosystem, right? So, from digital just being an innovation to a few year, few years ago to now being a core part of business, where brands define. On, on a yearly basis, the num- the amount of sales which have to be driven by digital marketing, mm-hmm. right? So, things have really changed. Right. Now, between developed economies, where also Google and Meta are major players, mm-hmm. versus India, I think there is a difference, right? Okay. Because in India, data is cheap, mm-hmm. right? It has gone up recently, but data is still uh, ridiculously cheap. We're still the cheapest across the world, yeah. So, even though there are developed economies, people only have so much money to spend on data, right? So, which means that they are available on digital platforms uh, only for a certain amount of time. Because there's, ultimately, we all are humans, right? We are we can only spend so much time in a day uh, on digital platforms or offline platforms. Also. And there are only 24 hours in a day. So, the end result of that is that when you're an advertiser sitting out of US, mm-hmm. right? Uh, the inventory mm-hmm. or rather the impressions, mm-hmm. number of impressions you can get in front of a consumer are lesser and hence uh, more expensive mm-hmm. to purchase. While in India, we have a supply surplus. Mm-hmm. Right? Because simply put, more number of people mm-hmm. spending more time on data mm-hmm. across platforms mm-hmm. and India, to my mind, is very different if you look at, say, compared to even a big country like US, right, or Europe for that matter, simply because while we are one nation, right, we are, I think, a collection of nations right. within the country, right? So the context of every state, uh, of every person, uh, or collection of people is very different. As a result, as a result, while uh, Google and Meta, uh, you know, continue to uh, dominate, the space for other platforms to come in, disrupt, ask for their share, mm-hmm. uh, will, you know, continue to uh, grow, right? Now, there are two trends, or rather two things which I see happening okay. right now is that it's become very important as a brand that how do you integrate different mediums and, you know, drive eff- efficiency there, right? That while TV might drive, uh, you know, reach for you in tier 2, tier 3 and beyond at a much cheaper, uh, you know, cost per reach versus digital. But at the same time, it's very difficult to measure business outcomes, right? At the end of the day, because even in these towns now, you're not dependent only on offline for your sales. You are seeing consumers who are willing to, you know, order even uh, order stuff online, even from uh, parts we didn't imagine earlier, right? So, as a result, what happens is, you will find that, uh, in fact, there's also one government uh, intervention which helped. Because globally, you see, TikTok is actually taking over Mm -hmm. spends from, say, Google and Meta, and they are a genuine third big platform, which is a threat, right? right? In India, that's not the case. In India, Mm -hmm. it has left the space open for multiple platforms to come into that space. And in fact, in some ways, it has also, I feel, helped Meta. Because the adoption of Reels was yes. now, uh, I think the Twitter equivalent, which they have launched, X equivalent, which they have launched uh, 
I'm forgetting the name. I'm not a big user. But anyway, uh, so there is space and there is context for multiple platforms to exist and grow. So now, if I have to look at it uh, in the next three to five years, mm -hmm. right? You will find that the overall ad spends mm -hmm. will continue to grow, mm -hmm. but it will get redistributed. Redistributed in two ways. That one is digital and TV. I feel will sort of combine okay. in a way where you'll find that a lot of planning will be TV plus digital. Interesting. Uh, it is happening, but I think it is not at the point where, you know, 30, 35,000 crores of TV sort of suddenly become digit included in digital. I don't think it is at that point. But uh, you will find that marketers will look at it that way, right? And uh, programmatic does that, right? So you will have multiple inventories being available on programmatic. So people will want to buy centrally. Will TV come into it or not? I don't think uh, the ecosystem will allow it. But ultimately, advertisers are demanding and this space will continue to evolve. The second part is that while the 1 lakh crore ad spends will go to a certain level, anybody's guess, you can take whatever number you choose. Let's, for example, say, take 1 lakh 20,000 crores, maybe in the next two, three years, as the point where sort of this settles. The share of digital mm. might even further increase, mm. right? Uh, but at the same time, there is only so much two major platforms can do. Correct. Right? So the, there also money will get redistributed. Now coming to points of quick commerce and e-com, right? Because these are the two which I think will, uh, like, you know, take away or uh, help in the redistribution, right. so to say, is that at the e-com you're right, Amazon, Flipkart and other smaller platforms have come in and they do, you know, help brands drive digital sales a lot and help achieve those KPIs. But quick commerce, yeah. right, is, I think, uh, about a year ago, everybody was questioning right. that, you know, why do I need something in 10 minutes? Yeah. Is it safe for the riders who are delivering it? Uh, you know, the, even social Correct. questions were raised on this. As of today, the adoption has been phenomenal, right? And if, again, coming back to the user at mm -hmm. the center of it, right? Consumers are willing to pay for convenience, right? right? Consumers are willing to pay for, uh, you know, the, I think India is also evolving as an economy where let's say the top 5% in India are realizing the value of time. Mm -hmm. Similar to sort of how the Western societies look at it. Right. We are also valuing our time more. So as a result, today, that same consumer may not be willing to pay for an OTT subscription. They might, you know, be totally unhappy if a e-commerce platform is charging them delivery fee, mm -hmm. right, for uh, buying something online. But at the same time, they will pay a platform fee or a convenience fee to a Blinkit or Zomai right. without even thinking twice about it. Correct. So again, uh, you know, to my mind, this is one space yeah. which will really, really explode. And uh, brands will also try to leverage and see, okay, how can this medium mm -hmm. really scale and contribute to a larger pie for me? Correct. Can it actually help me subsidize what I do for offline mm -hmm. sales, right? Can it actually? So can, lay, say, a distributor for me become a dark store where I do some revenue sharing with one of these platforms? Mm -hmm. I mean, just a wild idea, but it may or may not happen, right? So this is something which will continue to evolve. And you will find that uh, the share of digital will increase. Plus, that 80% will sort of mm -hmm. come down. But obviously, do expect that with AI coming in and our targeting abilities, mm -hmm. uh, again, reaching the consumer in the right context, at the right time, with the right ad, this ability will continue to evolve with AI models, right? And programmatic becoming more widespread. I think one point is that um, with quick commerce, I feel psychology is at play here. While initially I was also skeptic saying, besides medicine, besides anything oh. noteworthy of emergency, why would anybody want anything under 10 minutes? But just the fact of things are available under 10 minutes, it can be delivered. That alone itself will drive people to the platform. Nobody wants iPhone 16 Pro in 10 minutes. Yeah. But eventually there will come a time when everything available on Amazon or Flipkart will be available on Blinkit and Swiggy. Yeah. Now, the point is, this idea of uh, 
whatever I order, since everything is available on Blinkit, can reach me on the same day. Itself yeah. will drive a lot of uh, people to the app. They may not order anything. Okay. I've ordered monthly groceries on Blinkit. Used to happen on Big Basket, but I keep switching in also what is available, what is not, etc., etc. But yeah. yeah, and also D two C we talked about and Quick Commerce. Well, what other uh, digital platforms than Quick Commerce to take your brands and help them discover? In fact, let me take a step back mm -hmm. in this one, right? Uh, because I think there is a larger point in this that while the pandemic taught us that consumers are willing to go online mm -hmm. when they want to purchase something. I think retail will still, offline retail and the ability of spaces where you can go touch, feel, experience products will also evolve, right? But to my mind, it may not evolve or uh, what it used to deliver say 10 years ago versus what it will now deliver for brands will be very different. So take the example like this, right? Imagine, uh, you know, let's say apparel or shoes, mm -hmm. they are available across platforms, Correct. right? They are available, and let's take the example of, let's say, Decathlon, right? Now it's available on a quick commerce app. Correct. Well, right? But will it reduce the relevance of their offline stores? stores? I don't think so, for two reasons. One is that it will also attract a certain kind of audience uh, who are not on quick comm and obviously yes. will continue to spend. And they will, they are sort of legards in this and they will eventually become, uh, you know, come to a point where they will adopt quick commerce. But think of it like this, right? Offline spaces sort of become experience centers for brands, mm. while the ultimate purchase happens online at the consumer's convenience, yeah. right? So, since we have become more involved in our, you know, purchases as consumers, and especially in high involvement categories, mm -hmm. there is a huge research period. Mm -hmm. right, 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 right. So, imagine if you even want to buy a shoe, mm. right? Uh, Earlier, it used to be okay. Is it the sports shoe or is it some? Is it the leather shoe which I can wear to work? Right. Today, like the tree branches out, right? Yeah. There are multiple applications for you buying a sneaker, to you buying a shoe for workouts, to you buying a shoe for training in gym, yeah. right? Correct. Yeah. So we have the ability to pay, but we also have now uh, nuance in our needs, right? right? Uh, so you will research a lot, right? And then ultimately, to decide, you might experience a brand. Or multiple brands at an offline store. And then at the end of it, once you know more or less what you're looking for, I think as Indians, we would buy where it is cheapest. That's true. And then obviously there are some consumers who want everything now and they're willing to pay a premium for it. But to my mind, it is still uh, a smaller portion of the population. I think one point you touched on, Rudvish, is the smart team, CT yeah. team. Yeah. So, talking about what Google and Meta can offer right now for yeah. inside advertisers and brands, yeah. um, what are certain things, I would put it like this, what are certain ad formats which Google and Meta cannot offer, but digital platforms, right from content to commerce, can yeah. in India? So, you mentioned CTV is a very important, uh, very interesting ad. Can you talk about that? So, uh, firstly, I think it's it's not about what the... Uh, you know, these bigger platforms can or cannot offer mm -hmm. to my mind, right? Uh, again, going back to what the advertisers are looking to achieve and also where they will find users, right? Con so content. If, if you keep it in a very simple way, mm -hmm. advertisers want to be where the users are mm -hmm. in the right context, right? So, you know, coming back to ad formats, right? And how, uh, so one favorite topic of mine is also connected TVs. Mm -hmm. Right, and especially with content consumption becoming so fragmented even in the TV space. Yeah. Uh, I don't think consumers care anymore whether I am watching a satellite channel mm -hmm. or I am watching something which is delivered to me via data. Mm -hmm. I don't think I have ever thought about that. Mm -hmm. Or a lot of consumers have ever thought about that. Right? Earlier it was a case of distribution. Yeah. That you know, if you're in a smaller town, you didn't have DTH. Right. There is only a cable wala who will come to you yeah. with a defined package of <laughs> channels. Yeah. Uh, as a child, I remember, right, saying in Aldwani, where I used to wonder, you know, why do I want to watch Cartoon Network dubbed in Hindi? Right? I go to English medium school. Uh, I've lived in different cities. Yeah. Uh, 
why is this being forced face to me even as a child and now imagine uh, as an adult and especially with the amount of choices we have today you don't want to think like that so coming back to connected tvs right so india to my mind and uh, also as per data uh, the tv universe is about 210 million households right so if you take a multiplier of maybe four people at an average urban will be less or rural will be higher uh, broadly say 90 crore out of the 140 crore people in india uh, view tv and are measurable right so you know there is a there is a method to the madness by which people evaluate how their tv plan is work right and which channels work for them which channels don't work for them today i feel a large part of this uh will start shifting towards video on demand in a way right and connected tvs are going to play a part at that as people start having more access to data and fast data right especially with 5g coming in and uh, you know wifi being like a very basic necessity uh across india and also bharat now you will find that people are uh so people are willing to pay for choices right so connected tv uh, will continue to grow and that is one space uh it will first to my mind initially come at the cost of you know pay tv and dtch where people who is already have a set top box will let's say shift towards share a set top box which can do more correct right uh it can give me more consumption options then people are also in the space of being cord cutters or cord nevels right where uh the lifestyles we live are such that you cannot perhaps catch a prime time tv show at 9 pm right right uh, you might catch on it over a saturday sunday and you want video on them right so people will buy smart tvs they will continue to buy and especially with the cost of smart tvs coming down so much you're saying that look it's not just a screen anymore right if i'm buying a tv i might as well buy a smart buy a tv for say a 3 to 5 year or maybe more i don't yeah. think so regular non smart tvs are sold anymore i think every tv is a smart tv today and and that's the point right because the access cost yeah. and uh, has become so low right that you you don't tend to even think about it twice and uh we as consumers are again not looking at just functionally okay is it a screen which will connect to a box and project content can it do more for me right and these are questions we ask and we will we are willing to pay for brands also know that so they are the products are also evolving at that pace so bottom line being that out of the 90 crore people who watch tv in india this whole space will sort of get redistributed mm-hmm. and connected tv is the space which will continue to really grow uh at the same time right there is there is always this perception in brands uh, that you know connected tv is the most premium thing in the world mm-hmm. right and uh, they they look at it as uh, i think the perception will change from okay i have five brands in my portfolio mm-hmm. this is the most premium brand mm-hmm. so this brand should be on connected tvs mm-hmm. to all these five brands actually you know bring me customers across economic strata okay so connected tv will now become a core part of my tv planning itself mm-hmm. so i think this change will happen and continue to redistribute spends between digital and tv right. so this is where i think the lines will blur right. so if you look at uh, say a 30 35000 crore tv pie out of the overall say overall ad spend mm-hmm. and you look at say a 30 40000 crore digital ad spend pie now imagine this is combined maybe 70 80% of the overall ad spend i mean again right. depending on which report you write right. here there will be a lot of redistribution because of this one phenomena and does it require interventions and you know common measurement validate validating data and on the yes 100% but to my mind this is the space which will really evolve and churn okay. and also talking about the going back to ad formats i think smart tvs or connected tvs open up 
new spaces to show ads. For example, Absolutely. access to a conventional TV, you switch it on, and if it is a set-top box, there is some ad shown somewhere. But yeah. any smart TV you open, there is a screen presented to you, and content discovery itself is one opportunity to show ads. Absolutely. The mastheads we see, the moment we open a Samsung smart TV, there it is, the Mercedes-Benz or Lexus or whatever it is. Absolutely. So it opens up fresh new formats. So it brings together, I think it brings to the fore uh, the traditional benefits of digital, yeah. but in a large screen context, which brands yeah. have been buying since ages, right? Yeah. So it, it's like the best of both worlds, yeah. in a way, right? That's where you have the scale right. going forward of BV, mm -hmm. but you can target by user. Right. You can target by interests, mm -hmm. you can target by context. Correct. So that to my mind is where, you know, things will really evolve. And as a result, even the ad formats in which a customer or a user gets intercepted will evolve. So from TV being the place where you want your TVC or it's called TVC, right? Where your ad film to be seen, right? Uh, to now, not just video, right? Being in the right context at the right time to the consumer is what will matter. So like you spoke of content discovery. Uh, I think earlier it was simple, right? You had certain number of channels. You know what you're going to, you know, which channel the number you're going to at say 9 p.m. I remember like, on a daily newspaper yeah. on weekends yeah. to see what was available on ESPN Star Sports and a channel Cotton listing, Sport. right? Yeah. I used to go to that particular TV guided list on the newspaper. But today we today again video on demand. Trade you want things at your own time, at your own schedule. No longer appointment viewing. Except obviously for live sports and news, yes. everything else is can be consumed anytime, any number of times, anywhere, any device. And see, look, ultimately, it's nobody has infinite budgets, right? If you look at it just from the advertiser point of view, uh, so they will have to optimize their media mix. It's just that there was a point where you would decide on a media mix and say this is it for the next three years. You know, along with your five-year plan, you've also aligned on this is how I'm going to be on my media for the next one year, three year and five year, right? I think now it changes and has the, and there is significant change happening every three to six months. Mm -hmm. So you can't just align something at the start of the year and, and assume everything will work out. Okay, at the same time, the, the other story here is that it doesn't mean you have to be impatient as an advertiser, right? You need to, uh, if the consumer inciting work you have done, points to a certain medium or certain, say, let's say audio. Mm -hmm. if, if you know audio is going to work for you and consumers are more receptive mm -hmm. to you on audio, then you have to persist with it, right? It cannot be a flash in the pan of innovation you did for uh, one quarter. Mm -hmm. It is something you persist with. And then eventually you take a call. Is it is it driving business results for you or not? So I think marketers also then tend to look at it in the same lens. Audio is a very interesting uh, space actually. What audio represented a decade, decade and a half ago was radio, yeah, FM, and but today it is not just that anymore. Podcasts uh, because it's very immersive, and also you get undivided attention because people okay. tend to wear earphones, no matter what they do. Our commutes are getting longer uh, when we do the household chores. We can't do it because we want content so much. Of course, we want, of course. to entertain our, ourselves so much that there is always we are watching something, we are listening something, reading something. That captive audience is not available to you. even at a household level on a smart TV. No, Absolutely. no chance at all. But if you are very careful, if you are very crafty about what message you want to send in that captive space, I mean, audio is fantastic opportunity for it. So you're right, and there are I think many such you know niche which exist, but. Uh, I think from a marketing standpoint, you always look for, okay, this is right. It's true for maybe, say, 5 million people in India. Yeah. So but fine, addressable market, my yeah. target group is much higher. So it requires, uh, you know, the ability of a marketer to look at things from a 30,000 feet view Correct. and also be willing to see what the consumer actually does on the ground. So, but yeah, you, there are, like I said, right, this, Holes, it's a digital tree which will continue to branch out. Correct. correct. And as a brand, yeah. you have to be present on every branch. Right. right. Um, especially 
this message of uh, the choice available to them. That is what excites me too much, right? From the most immersive to the most expansive. Yeah. And that you cannot, no advertiser brand can say, no, I'll only advertise here or there because you have to go where people are. Absolutely. This choice itself is fascinating. That evolution of choice itself is... Uh, no. Particular. You you can also look at the next few years, right, in terms of uh, evolution of content consumption, right? Mm -hmm. People will not just be looking at, okay, this is a show I like, so I'll watch it, or this is like a live match happening, so I'll watch it, because I can you know, watch it yeah, right. from the palm of my eye. But people will look for immersive experiences. If you look at the recent uh, Menta event which happened, right, and uh, it's a match I never thought would happen, but Meta, you know, combining with a brand like a legacy brand like Ray Bahari Bang, right, a brand which has stood for perhaps style for the longest time, mm -hmm. Uh, with uh, Tom Cruise and <laughs> Top Gun and whatnot, right? Now today, I think it's a major step forward where uh, I think product folks in the AR, VR space yeah. and people who are actually working on delivering immersive experiences yeah. to users have understood that you can deliver the best experience in the world, yeah. right? But it has to also come with some, you have to also address the vanity part of it, right? Yeah. You cannot be wearing <laughs> AR, VR <laughs> goggles. <laughs> And we seen like that. That's where you see that uh, when the Apple Vision was launched, mm -hmm. and uh, now with uh, you know Meta going into this space, uh, if I think that also shows that they are at some confidence level in terms of solving for what it is functionally going to do Correct. for a user. Now that they are understanding that for adoption to happen, the user simply has to look good while doing it, right? So initially, I think if uh, if there's a very close example here, right, that a few years ago. Uh, when the wireless headphones came in and AirPods came in and all that, initially people uh, were worried about, okay, if I have this, will I lose it? Yeah. Can I work out in it? Uh, will somebody just, you know, pick it up and I'll not realize it? Like, <laughs> <don't know> <laughs> so, to, to, back to today, uh, I mean, the share of wireless headphones has exploded. The cost of acquiring one has drastically come down. Similarly, uh, while it's a bigger shot than earphones, but uh, I feel you will see similar stuff happening mm. and commerce getting integrated into it, influencer content getting in, in you know, inside it. And it's not going to be a simple case. Uh, so, in a way, the world becomes a storefront. Correct. Right? For the user. Uh, it's not just about, okay, do I purchase something on my mobile or am I going to an offline store to buy? Yeah. That's true. Talking about uh, immersive, I yeah. feel very sorry for us. You know, we have these hype cycles for technology. They go up. Now it is AI. Yeah. I feel sorry for Metaverse, which used to be a talking point. Just, not just a year or two ago. Yeah. But it all boils down to this particular thing, immersive experience. That is what Metaverse is at the end. Of Absolutely. It. And even then, Apple Vision Pro, their collaboration with Formula One, where there was a use case where you have this large screen, you wear the uh, Vision Pro, and you tilt your head downwards, you can pay a little bit extra or something like that, and you can project the actual race track. Uh -huh. And there are dots which track and everything, who is at the pit stop and everything. So if you want to consume it regular, you watch that. If you want more details, you're geeky, nerdy, and want to follow these. I mean, this is just the beginning. See, it's, it's like fads come and go, right? Yeah. Uh, but, and while the fad is taking up as a brand, yeah. you always wonder, will this really last or not, right? So... I, I take off two current examples. Mm -hmm. right? So, as people get more fitness conscious, mm -hmm. people get more about uh, longevity, you know, living longer, experiencing life and all that, right? But while that mindset comes in, now every product you want to buy, right? And every, it's a case of premiumization as well, right? Where how do you make people pay more for the same product? Everything is sprinkled with protein. So, you want to buy berry? People will tell you, oh, this has 15 grams of protein, mm -hmm. so, you know, you should buy it. Yeah. Uh, you go to, uh, you know, even basic, uh, like, uh, even if you want to buy a dessert, right? Yeah. Uh, people will talk about how much protein it has. Yeah. Till few years ago, at least in our country, that was not the case, right? And similarly, in the tech space, yeah. uh, I mean, I think there's a certain amount of FOMO, yeah. where brands feel that if they are not talking about AI, yeah. Uh, <laughs> one, consumers will not respond to it and they'll suddenly feel that their product is inferior mm. to the competition. At the same time, mm. 
see ultimately as a big brand you are also answerable to shareholders right so if in your uh plan for the next year and when you are addressing those people who have invested in your company and if you're not talking about ai and what you are going to do or evolve your business mm-hmm. uh in that sense it directly impacts uh, your market cap and the value you command right in the market so it's it's like damned if you do damned if you don't right of course so and also there is uh, behind or underneath all of these so called refuse from the technology standpoint yeah. see today it is ai a year ago it was metaverse a few years ago it was crypto blockchain yeah. or bitcoin so most of the use cases might be fine like you said but there is philosophically underneath there is a certain truth yeah what did cryptocurrency sort of represent it represent smart contracts yeah you know the way of decentralizing stuff what did metaverse represent it represented immersive experiences what does ai represent ai represents doing better being more efficient being more effective being more creative yeah so there is an underlying truth tru- today the use case might be different and 10 years from now vastly different absolutely but I, the philosophy would stays the same he and it's about uh, while it seems very difficult today yeah. right it's also about what are the new categories uh, which will emerge right so till till i think regulation aside crypto just suddenly came into being and it exploded right uh, if you look at let's say smartphones mm-hmm. uh, till about say 20 years ago right how uh, obviously cost of production and all those and uh, economies of scale take over and then uh, it drives adoption but the use case of a smartphone uh, till say even 5 years ago versus today absolutely different and uh, at the same time there is always this uh, brands and companies right are trying to build products which unlock a customer need which they feel the customer didn't even know about right right uh, there is always this sharp contrast where brands like apple will talk about you know you can't just listen to the consumer and make a product and they have been successful by doing that while at the same time uh, brands are also accused of being tone deaf and not being not listening to consumers and evolving right so like i said it's a it's a bold peak balance but disproportionate amount of money mm-hmm. or uh, can be made when you bring out a product which simply scales and solves a need which nobody knew existed yeah. that's that's a good point actually true innovation happens not through committee sort of uh, feedback there was this uh, i interviewed uh, um, an australian uh, he's into b2b saas win and loss analysis he had given a beautiful example of go back to the point when henry ford was about to launch the ford model t if he would have gone out on the streets of new york or san francisco or anywhere and asked people where people used to use horses to yeah. travel to commute if he was to ask them how can i improve your mode of transport they would say give me faster horses <laughs> but but who would have said i want put a mechanical bit in it yeah put four wheels in it make a seat inside nobody would have said. true innovation <laughs> doesn't happen but yeah the balance is absolutely you know, has to be maintained so coming back to advertisers okay um i'm very much interested in how the media buying or the ad space buying happens especially in the context of what you do yeah. uh, we we talked about uh, what advertisers can achieve right from uh, driving awareness to actual sales bottom of the line making people buy stuff yeah so how does this media planning sort of uh, happen and what do advertisers want to achieve and how they measure it what is the role of platforms in helping on advertisers measure what they want to achieve so the the way again you have to look at it is that there is a certain uh, if you go back to basics right as an advertiser firstly you are a business mm-hmm. right so let's say you have a certain turnover let's say you are a 1000 crore brand mm-hmm. right and that's the kind of turnover you do depending on the category you are in right so suppose you are in a very mature category like say fmcg if you are in the soaps right the margins you are operating at uh, are very different your distribution is very different mm-hmm. versus let's say somebody who are say loopier plugs 
to be right if you take that example it's a new product i think i don't think most people would even know where it sells but the point being that what is the turnover you have what do you actually what's the bottom line that you make and how much of that bottom line are you willing to sacrifice to achieve that number right mm-hmm. at the same time there are also new brands which come in and with a lot of vc money which had come in over the past few years which want to come in and disrupt mm-hmm. they're willing to burn cash yeah. right so as a marketer that's the starting point right, right. who are you mm-hmm. once you define that then you get into which medium works for me and uh, what kind of platforms deliver to me and then it boils down to kpis mm-hmm. right so imagine you are a new fintech app mm-hmm. right your primary goal in your first two years would be acquiring users correct at whatever cost mm-hmm. right so you will go ballistic across mediums mm-hmm. you will want to cover all possible consumer touch point that's what happened with crypto right correct it's not like and it was a case where while i've said before that nobody has infinite money mm-hmm. but they did have closer to infinite <laughs> money <laughs> well, right where uh, because it was a time bound thing right for it to really move from a fad to widespread adoption uh you had to go into that space so now coming to kpis right that how do advertisers look at those things right so you will align your business objectives against that you will say that okay to achieve that number which we are going for mm-hmm. we need to reach out to a certain number of people out of india's population and i would need to do that at a certain frequency right. right i need to look at am i reaching them on a tv screen mm-hmm. which is like you know uh, like it's a wide way of going and reaching out to consumers also am i reaching the person at the last mic mm-hmm. so which are the mediums which solve for that mm-hmm. and everything in between mm-hmm. right so you will look at okay our uh, tv maybe helps me reach mm-hmm. a certain threshold of people but it is doing that at a frequency which is perhaps too high right mm-hmm. because consumers are not watching as much tv anymore so i can only reach so many people at that point so i supplement that with digital platforms right to build reach and frequency so so you will first define your top funnel metrics right you will define uh, how do how will i make these people who have now been exposed to my brand right. reconsider mm. and how do i stand you know differentiated versus the competition so that ultimately when this user mm. is going to buy a product you know my chances of doing that are higher right so you have to as a brand plan for mm. how will you deploy your media to move consumers who can potentially buy that category product during your aop or your business year and move them through the funnel and eventually achieve your goal right mm-hmm. now the kpis are very different for different medium right so of course when you're looking at tv you will look at grps you will look at uh, you know across which channels have actually worked for me or not if i i saw it a few markets it did that really increase footfalls for me or traffic on my website right uh then when you come to digital right again on digital it depends on the category you are working on right the evolved category like fmcg where you buy consumers buy that product every month right you need to plan in that manner that your media also is deployed like that while when you are taking a sharp contrast say of uh say a car brand mm-hmm. you would look at i should reach out to the consumer mm-hmm. when i have a new launch to talk about right like that will actually help me drive yeah. footfalls so again your media mix will depend on this uh that what are you trying to achieve uh, and how that will drive your business objectives but how do you measure that eventually right so you will look at different metrics for different parts of the funnel right, right. so if you're looking at top funnel right you will look at sometimes i feel these are vanity metrics but people will look at okay how many uh you know views have come on my youtube channel mm. right so people used to uh this used to be a big metric 5 years ago okay. but nobody was asking the question that how many of these views are paid versus organic right right right, right. while all of us know intuitively 
that some a user who has reached your channel and watched your content mm -hmm. organically mm -hmm. is a much more valuable consumer to you mm -hmm. than somebody who's just been you know uh, paid or rather you have bought the time to show that mm -hmm. I think so, so that's so you would look at uh, the number of views you would look at completion rates you would look at the uh, okay if X million people started viewing my ad. How many of them actually ended up watching the complete? Ad? Complete, yeah, complete. Did this change if my ad got exposed to them more number of times? Mm -hmm. What is the right frequency at which I should reach to these people like across media? Right, you will evaluate your top funnel metrics from there. Mm -hmm. Obviously, with your overall goals, that did I hit a reach number? Did I, uh, you know, in certain markets, did I over index, under index? So you will constantly try to evolve that. Then when you go towards the bottom funnel, right, you will look at, uh, you have your own website, you have your own touch points on digital, right? How much quality time, how many quality visits are you getting? Are people coming there and really engaging with your content? So you take the example of, let's say, a car website. How many people actually, you know, come to your website and fill in requests for test drives? <laughs> You make a fancy AR, VR model. Do people actually bother to look at it? Uh, people have gone to the level of building configurators where you can actually configure the kind of car which you will eventually buy. So, how people you know, interact with these and then you can perhaps retarget them tells you a lot about the KPIs which you look at for bottom funnel. Right? But at the same time, uh, to my mind, there is a sometimes I feel too much emphasis on performance marketing side of things, mm -hmm. right? Where uh, it's it's like a tightrope. Brands need to be willing to understand that branding has its price, correct? But it's also giving them longer term benefits. Right. While performance marketing uh, shows you that okay, you have driven so many sales and you have retargeted users, and there is a bottom line which you can show, but it also tends to fade if you stop spending on brain. So again, you have to you have to fill the funnel. Correct. I would say with spends right. So so those are the metrics which essentially people look at. But the new term right now, right? This has been the case over the past few years. But okay. now, I think across categories, especially new age categories, uh, people are looking at it a bit differently because earlier you could differentiate between people going for footfalls at your offline stores and you know buying something on Apple if your product is listed on Amazon right. now with D2C coming in and the number of touch points where a user can actually go and buy your product like I said the world has become a storefront Correct. right <laughs> so it has now evolved to a point where people are saying okay uh, I will not look at only what every medium is doing for me while I continue to evaluate that I put 100 crores into marketing or advertising this year. Did it drive 1,000 crores of sales for me? And can I measure and attribute that? So ROAS, return on advertising trends, has become the new buzzword, right? And everybody, and this has also happened due to the you know, evolution of e-com and now quick com, where a brand would come on an e-com platform, right? And they would say, look, my product is listed. I'm anyway spending across everywhere you look. So why do I need to spend on that particular platform? Right? Why do I need to spend on, say, search on Amazon? Why do I need to spend on the category pages of Amazon? Right? But ultimately, it boils down to, look, if there is a commitment on the table that... An advertiser will put X crores mm -hmm. and the e com platform will deliver, say, 10x, 20x yeah. in terms of turnover. Then there is a common understanding right. that a certain amount of revenue will be required yes. to spend. And the ROAS is very well different from the very start. Right. And this is, so it is the equivalent of mm -hmm. uh, a few years ago when as a brand you would set up distribution mm -hmm. within a country and you would align uh, that if the brand has to achieve, say, 10,000 crores in sales in India, each distributor or each center, each right. area office, regional office, would contribute to that. Yes. This is the digital equivalent of that. So that's how, if I have to draw a parallel, 
uh, that's how things are evolving where distribution your top line bottom line and also advertising spends are now being talked together rather than separate departments or right. that's an interesting part it this sort of uh, makes me think about how much of attribution is actually possible are there so leaky buckets can everything be traced measured and attributed look coming from a digital background uh, i would i would have to say that there is some framework within the digital ecosystem to actually attribute right is it perfect i don't think so is it skewed towards some of the bigger platforms yes but is it more evolved than offline Yes, because consumers are displaying signals Correct. on online platforms across the board, yeah. and you are able to measure that, right? So take the example of, in fact, uh, let's let's take the example of say I think every ten days there is a new phone which launches, right? right. You, yeah. and uh, we are at that point where I think there are seven hundred, eight hundred million smartphones in India, and people do have a cycle of changing that. Now take the example of. a new phone which mm-hmm. launches right mm-hmm. and uh, you have a pre launch a pre booking phase and you know there is a buzz creation which happens like the new iphone which launched oh, you know it's coming on a certain date yes. you are already prepping okay what am i going to sell my current phone for <laughs> who's going to give me the best exchange where is the bank offer then you are actually already doing the math which the brands eventually advertise in you know yes, paper ads yes. and all that that this is the effective price mm-hmm. for you because it's a need yes. it's not a luxury anymore right So you're already doing that math in your mind, right? So there is how do advertisers leverage that, right? So eventually, now imagine in a launch period, even before a product is launched, you have been searching crazily about it yes. because you're in market to buy a smartphone, right? You look at live events, you look at uh, the launch event which will happen, right? You will look at okay, is it exciting to me or not? uh the thirst to buy that product actually starts coming in right uh you look at at that point now the larger point here is at that point you will be exposed to that brand even sometimes let's say you're not in the market right for buying a phone but you still might eventually buy but at that point you are exposed across mediums current right but does it mean that if you went to say uh, amazon and searched for that product at that point of time and eventually bought it say within a week yeah. does it mean only that ecom platform is responsible for the sale uh, right. right right are they right in saying that i was the platform which actually delivered and you were able to measure that yes but can you for sure say that a consumer who perhaps did not see a print ad that day where you know it was all about okay this is what it will eventually cost to you that actually gave the final nudge right it's debatable correct, so that's correct. why uh, the larger point here is that uh is there attribution possible mm-hmm. yes very much so it is part of the goals of which brands take every year that you know say 30% of my sales have to come from digital platforms right you plan your year and bottom line and margins according to that but is it something so which you can really just say ki no ye aise hi hua no because because this the the other way to look at it is that when you will find a lot of people uh in this space who come and talk about oh no print is dead mm-hmm. oh no tv will you know vanish in the next mm-hmm. five years right. so people who are a bit fundamentalist yeah, yeah. in this I tend to stay away from those opinions. <laughs> uh, simply because, like I said, yeah. marketers have certain media objectives which are driven by Correct. the business they want Correct. to do, uh, and all platforms have a role to play in that. Right. The proportion of it can go up or down. Crazy. Yeah. But to say that certain mediums will just you know continue to not exist, mm. I don't think so. You take the example of out of home advertising. or radio for that matter today people are seeing a decline or you know cinema advertising and all that now tomorrow like i like in the case of tv right you don't uh, today you don't care whether the channel is given to you via satellite or data mm. tomorrow as an advertiser will you really care 
if the ads there are delivered programmatically, you have to buy them directly with colors. Maybe not. But will it serve some purpose in your media mix? 100%. That, that is true. I mean, this first touch and last touch attribution also mirrors in my field, B2B SaaS. Because if you look at website analytics of any B2B SaaS company, 60% or more of traffic, it shows the referral of Google. Yeah. The direct um, search. But what about what drove them to the search engine? While most of it is not attributable to the last point, but you just can't say, and only focus on the website and only focus on this because people who are discovering through brand searches anyway. So, so many things matter for that to happen. See, it's also about justification of spends, right? Because ultimately, some things don't change. Marketing till today is looked at as a cost. Cost. Right. So, if you are going super heavy on TV, if you are going super heavy on the bigger, bigger digital platforms which are there, At least they are solving for attribution, right? right? You, right. you do have the ability to say, I spent X amount of money and I drove, yeah, right. you know, say 3X amount of business from this over yeah. the year versus uh, if you look at the offline ecosystem or the overall ecosystem, you can't, uh, while the digital system is also not completely sorted, yes. like you said about last touch and first touch attribution, it's still better than no vision. Correct. Absolutely. So, will this evolve? 100%. It has to. Uh, but it also means that, you know, platforms in this ecosystem will have to be more open uh, than they currently are, right? You can't have world gardens and expect to see what's happening in each world garden as an advertiser, right? So, it's it's a tricky one. Also, in a generic sense, yeah. this brings me to I'm reading a book called The Tyranny of Metrics by Julian Allah. So, the fundamental message from the book is that uh, what can be measured may not always matter, but what matters may not be, we may not be able to measure that at all. Absolutely. So, why it is a North Star, why it is a guiding factor that is not be all and end all of what it is. So, Still, so many things have to be interpreted, but with the guidance of whatever fundamental metrics which we can track. I, I, I'll go back to, say, the example of Nike and that particular category, right? Mm -hmm. That uh, these metrics, which uh, marketers and all of us look at, mm -hmm. ultimately matter when you are, say, comparing brands and all. Correct. That everything else on the ground and in the customer experience is equal. <laughs> but it never is, yeah. right? So, let's say you take the example of, uh, say, a Nike mm. or a New Balance. If you are looking okay. at two competing brands, brands which are, okay. so one is on to, you know, going a bit downhill in coolness quotient, the other is suddenly the height right, right now, right? right? From being called ad shoes to <laughs> the new hottest sneakers in town. Right? It's, it's, a, it's a journey. But, now if you compare how they spend on digital and what kind of business outcomes they get. Mm. I I don't think you can, it's like apple and orange, right? Mm. Simply because the D2C presence mm. of Nike and the distribution they have yeah. is very different from what New Balance does. If you go to an offline store, yeah. the customer experience that you're getting there is hugely different. Correct. So, can you just directly say that if it's true for New Balance, it will be true for Nike? 100% not. So, these metrics, mm -hmm. I think, are also unique to a brand. And at the same time, you cannot compare it across brands mm -hmm. and say, okay, you know, this right. is uh, right. this is good or bad. And it brings me back to the larger point, right? Performance marketing or just focusing on immediate business outcomes. Mm -hmm. uh, while looks good for one quarter, but ultimately, the job of a marketer, yeah. again, is to create that pull yeah. for the brand so that you are eventually able to command a premium versus your competition. You can only capture demand if you generate it. And for that, I, I don't think there is a substitute to no. top finance. 100%. 100%. Thank you. We're talking about advertisers. I'm very keen to understand how you, your team, with your previous experience, your current role, all mix put together. Uh, 
what kind of people or teams are involved? What kind of technology do they use to serve advertisers? For example, when there are budget set and brands and address advertisers come to you, yeah. how much? I'm sure there is a lot of optimization as campaigns are launched. They look at campaigns. For example, the, for the common example I go back to is India versus West Indies. I want yeah. to show some ads. When India is batting, if it's a T20 game for the first five overs and the last five, but if it so happens that uh, the game gets washed out yeah. due to rain, and what will happen to those impressions if I only want to target high sort of uh, premium content like that? So what kind of people and tech actually gets used behind the scenes to serve advertisers? Very keen instant. Look, not to mince words, but I think the tech product and especially the operations people in this particular industry are the unsung heroes. Mm. Uh, you know, they they are actually there when the rubber hits the road, right? And uh, sometimes uh, the, uh, the tire gets punctured as well. You know, and they have to fix it on the go. And I could give multiple such examples, right? They're building the plane as you fly along all that. So, uh, but on a serious note, uh, you, when you are building a product, right, uh, you are obviously building it to one solve a need which exists in the market, right? So, for instance, if you are building an OTT app, you do have a business model planned around it, right? That you will acquire some content, you will create some content, you will buy some IPs, you will host that, and then you pray that people will come to watch it and eventually you will be able to monetize it. But scale is not unlimited. Right? So when you're building a tech product, you have to plan what you're going to invest in the product basis, what you eventually hope to garner in terms of revenue, right? Mm -hmm. And it's very difficult to plan, right? So if I take the example of, say, live sports mm -hmm. uh, five years ago, mm -hmm. I remember traveling in my car with a colleague, right? And he, uh, on those things that you have in a a car where you can just, you know, hang your phone, right, it's on course, maps yes, and all that. Yes, on the dashboard, yeah. I imagine, imagine the, he showed to me, you can watch a live match like this. Right? Yeah. And at that point, I remember maybe uh, 10,000 people were watching match at that point of time, right? Uh, cut to millions of people watching a match at the same time, right? Oh, because, yeah. Now imagine that if you have planned your product and your investments in a way mm -hmm. that uh, you are the vision of the business is that today there are 10k people watching it will evolve to maybe a million people watching at the same time versus that whole space actually exploding and you know crores of people watching at the same time the investments and the kind of know-how which goes into running these kind of uh, situations is very different now if you take the other example right? That that is a problem of scale the other problem is of going deeper into audiences mm. and understanding their behavior mm. and presenting them and then delivering them in a way Correct. which works better for advertisers, mm. right? That's a different ballgame altogether. How do you handle so much data? Mm. How do you translate that mm. into something which a advertiser can eventually target, right? So to my mind, uh, it's a constantly evolving phase. It is not like, okay, I've done this now the job is done. It's not like that. So as a result, you will find that this space is always, you will find people who are working in this space always feel like they are, you know, three, four steps behind the market and they're trying to catch up. But at the same time, uh, TV and print are sort of established products, mm -hmm. right? And advertisers look at buying impressions, reach and all of that, but the nuance and where I think operations, tech and product matters is that how an impression is delivered on a product which is excellent to use mm -hmm. versus how an impression is delivered mm -hmm. in, an in an environment or context where you are blind to ads. Right. Not the same. Yeah. Right? And hence they are priced in the same way and advertisers also, and, and a big part of digital selling pre-sales mm -hmm. is making the advertiser understand the context in which their ads will run. An impression is just not an impression. Correct. Uh, now coming to how how this will evolve, right? Now, if you look at uh, the advent of programmatic or self-serve, right? I think everybody thinks of automation at some point. Yeah. Because there is only so much work 
humans can do. There are only so many campaigns a person can set up, right? And also, it's in the spirit of transparency and giving more control back to agencies and advertisers mm-hmm. where they can set up and run campaigns, optimize on a real time. In fact, a lot of brands are going in the direction of setting up their own teams which manage uh, these platforms and optimize them real time and not depending on platforms completely. Correct. So, the way I look at it is, there is, uh, let's say if you have 100 rupees to spend in your digital advertising, there are some things where you will park for trying out. You will park on innovation. You will park on, you know, figuring out the new shiny thing in the market. And there is, there are some, the most of your money will still go into inventory which works hard for you and delivers results. So it's it's as simple as that and that is where I think the tech product and operations team have a huge role to play and they are the people who actually make it happen. So expanding on that, yeah, especially the people, the unsung heroes you're talking about. Yeah. I mean, today, uh, the amount of knowledge or skills they have to develop to survive and thrive in media sales or selling ad spaces is remarkable. So yeah. one example I have seen firsthand is with abundant data available to deeply understand content versus audience, commerce versus audience, everything about the platform and tell the best story to the advertiser yeah. so that he or she or the brand is convinced that yes, my money is well taken care of which means I will be able to reach the audience with whom I want to reach. Absolutely. How have you seen the role of people, be it on the operational or the sales side, especially the sales side, evolve and what skills matter today? Okay. Interesting. I, I, I Sometimes I, I gave this a bit of thought at some point in my career because uh, I'm a person who moved from a brand role uh, or a, a consulting stint eventually into media sales or digital sales, right? So, not the same skill set. Mm. But uh, but I think what's transferable is that you can have, uh, you know, unlimited data points. Mm. Two advertisers or people care about all of them? No. Right. They care about insights. Correct. What can a platform tell me which can help me improve my business? Mm. It's as simple as that. Suppose you have built three videos, right? Uh, you have taken three different brand ambassadors. Which one is actually working for you, right? Uh, telling an advertiser that, okay, you know, the, the video completion rates on all three are this, this, and this. Like, okay, great, but so what, right? So ultimately, I think the transferable skill is understanding the need of the consumer Correct. in this and then being able to marry yeah. what insights you have right. which help them do better right because uh, a lot of what happens in this particular industry is that people are not always looking at long term relationships people are uh, because, of, because there, is, there are everybody looks at the total addressable market mm-hmm. and say wow this is a 100,000 crore yeah. industry and you know what I just need to make 500 of this yeah, yeah, yeah. and I'm a sorted business <laughs> right but it's not as simple as that it isn't even for what you bring to the table there are five other platforms which can yeah. do the same right so how do you differentiate that it's through again the kind of insights you're able to get back to mm-hmm. and help an advertiser involved so that they invest in a long term relationship with you as well right because ultimately it also boils down to people so, technical skills, yes, uh, are more technicals required, technical skills required as of now versus say 10 years ago? 100%. Absolutely. Do you need to have, you know, the ability to keep learning and constantly evolve? 100%. Yeah. But I think what remains at the core of it is that you have to understand what you are ultimately delivering to the cons- uh, the consumer or the advertiser in this Correct. case. Correct. They are looking for insights, they are looking for actionables, and they are looking for ultimately how does this help them achieve more business. Yeah. It's as simple as that. Right. Uh, and that is where I think differentiators come as a platform. In my mind, the yeah. way I look at media sales people is like Sherlock Holmes. Yeah. 
you need the best of so, um, absolute attention and rationale. Yeah. At the same time, you have to be creative. Meaning, what is the best story I can tell the advertiser, but by looking at data, but by looking at what is happening Absolutely. on the platform. If you can't balance both, I think it becomes very difficult to convince advertisers. So, that's the difference. Respect from people in this line of business. And that's the difference versus traditional advertising, yeah. right? Where uh, if you are a big network, mm -hmm. or, you know, on TV and all, you know, advertisers will naturally come to you. Yeah. And on digital, uh, it's it's not compulsory, yeah. right? It's not compulsory. So as a result, you have to make your own space, your niche, and establish how you're differentiated versus other Correct. platforms. Correct. Because the fact of the matter is that in this particular space, now there is so much clutter mm. and so many problems to solve for yes. also, frankly. Yes. Yeah. Uh, that, But there is only so much time advertisers and agencies have, right? So, so that's how it is. So that, that is true. Talking about people, just yeah. as an extension of it. Yeah. In my own experience, I run a two-person content marketing agency. If 10 years ago, if somebody had to set up a very similar business and output a similar kind of work, it would have required at least a seven or eight people agency. Yeah, that is the power of technology today. So many things can be automated, so many things can be expedited and optimized because of technology. Yeah, I'm sure in the media sales uh, industry, in your line of business, especially mm -hmm. helping the sales side and the ops side, the campaign setting up and understanding audience, looking at data, reporting, all of that technology plays a very crucial part mm -hmm. in all of this. Some companies decide to build their own technology, some buy and some buy and look at it over a few years and say build on top of it. Yeah. Regardless of how it happens, what is the role of technology in your line of business? How important? I mean, it's a very fundamental question. I would say, how has or can technology make media sales people better and more productive? That's it. I think you touched the right word there, right? It's at the end of the day, uh, Everybody's evaluated on productivity. Correct. Right? So, like you rightly mentioned, till a few years ago, running the same business perhaps would have required more number of people. Yeah, yeah. Technology has evolved and so on and so forth. The way I look at digital businesses or advertising in uh, as a digital platform is that you have, there are multiple revenue streams possible. Correct. Right? So, if you look at an example of direct seats, mm -hmm. where you are, let's say, talking to the top 200 advertisers uh, in the country, their needs will be very nuanced. Their needs will be of a different scale. Correct. So deploying people to solve for that mm. makes economic sense. Correct. It's productive. Absolutely. Because the money on the table and the problems which you are solving for are all worth it at the end of the day. Right? So you will see that a lot of platforms tend to invest mm -hmm. in people who can solve for that. Right. Then... Like as consumers, right? You also look at your aspiration and people who are already achieving that. Mm -hmm. You also have a huge chunk of advertisers mm -hmm. who are not in the top 200 and they they are perhaps kings in their own smaller kingdoms, right? Mm -hmm. But they also look at, they also need to be serviced. Yeah. But their needs perhaps mm -hmm. are served by, say the most of which is available on which is self serve, right? Correct. And Correct. the basic stuff yes. they are able to do, yeah. and it serves their businesses, right? So there is no need, perhaps, there for mm -hmm. uh, having a separate mm -hmm. or more number of people on that one. Then there is, then you try to create revenue streams mm -hmm. which don't require too many salespeople, right? So if you have your own programmatic, your own, uh, you know, available, your inventory is available through different revenue streams, you do partnerships. Mm -hmm where other people are also selling on your behalf, right? So it creates an ecosystem where there is one part where you're trying to scale, mm. one part which will serve, you know, majority of the advertisers, and one part which is more like an automated revenue stream. Mm. And ultimately, you are, uh, it's like production capacity in manufacturing, mm. you are operating at a certain, mm. you know, sell-through rate in your inventory. So technology, has helped enable that, right? Because without your own platforms or, uh, you know, self-serve or programmatic, you wouldn't do that earlier. Today, you can do that. Correct. And now in programmatic with 
मल्टीपल एड फॉर्म एड्स कमिंग इन दाइट एंड एडवर्टाइजर्स बींग एबल टू बाय सेंट्रली राइट एफिशेंटली कंट्रोलिंग एक्सपोजर्स इन दैट यूर इट जस्ट बिकम्स मोर एफिशेंट फॉर दैम टू बाय लाइक दैट एंड इट डज रिड्यूज द क्वान्टिटी ऑफ पीपल रिक्वायर्ड टू स्केल अ बिजनेस एट द सेम टाइम लाइक आई सेट for each need right there is there are multiple platform but each platform has a nuance so the risk is that an impression becomes an impression and you get commoditized mm-hmm. so for differentiation and actually driving narratives doing narrative based selling consultative selling mm-hmm. you need people correct and the case studies of perhaps the top 200 advertisers of how you utilize a platform when you put your mind to it are actually what drive the next 2000 advertisers and set the tone for the right right is so that's to my mind my two cents on the right so i will mean, listen sense so talking about that let's say servicing the cream of the crop of the top yeah. 100 advertisers and obviously how to deploy the best minds here yeah. the best skin sets helping them talking also about helping them be more productive um let me take an example for example the sales be it uh, media sales or prevention I and mean, in this yeah. case media sales there is always a crm angle yes so sales people are supposed to sell but in some cases it so happens that there more data spent buying rendering data everywhere and sales people always say there is always this g2 report and sales force report and say sales people spend more time doing administrative work and less time selling if only they could make more time to sell they could be more productive they can bring more revenue etc etc from the art angle in your line of business yeah either you go to your engineering team and say build this for me for this particular use case or you look outward in the market for a third party solution how do you assess an ad tech solution okay see like you said uh, like we discussed earlier i think the it all comes down to productivity mm-hmm. and so if you ask any sales person that uh, okay you have to document what you are doing on crm right people look at it from two angles right okay does i'm bringing in business and why doesn't the organization it's just trust me i'll deliver right but second way to look at it is that people feel that the time that they're spending in front of a screen they perhaps could have been spending in front of a large advertiser they can away from that. so is that really the best use of time mm-hmm. uh if these systems are efficient then i don't feel it is a waste of time yeah simply because when you're solving for the big advertisers you're not just solving for okay this is my vanilla solution yeah. pick and choose whatever you yeah. like that's not consultative selling yeah. right you are actually trying to match right. and be a partner correct with their business and marketing objectives correct for that to happen mm-hmm. how do you translate all the nuance and insights mm-hmm. that you get sitting in front of an advertiser to mm-hmm. and make people in your product teams mm-hmm. your tech teams your strategy teams mm-hmm. how do you make them understand that right there is always going to be a loss in translation mm-hmm. but also when you document things mm-hmm. you are also putting it a certain thought around it right you are you are trying to understand the problem better and hence can we the problem better so it leads to i think better collaboration mm-hmm. it leads to also you thinking as a platform is this a problem i want to solve mm-hmm. is it making business sense for me and if you ask a sales person it will always make business sense <laughs> but if you ask somebody who's not directly sitting in front of uh, the advertiser they might have a view which is you know aligned with the larger business objectives mm-hmm. so to drive that collaboration crm is just one example right these kind of ad tech solutions are required these kind of uh how do i say productivity solutions are required mm. because as we scale right uh, if, if it's okay it's okay if you're just servicing 10 advertisers in a country so you have five people doing that yeah. you're sorted mm. but if you want to scale to a multi 100 crore business uh, it will not happen mm. without these solutions that that's true can i can i on the same line hmm. um shram a uh, b2b says content marketers perspective yeah how often do you or in your line of business is ad tech which gets used day to day 
actually revisited and said, can we make it more efficient? Can we replace it? Can we build something else? How often does it? I think we are always one step behind. In the, and this is not specific to the organizations I worked for. Across the board. Across. So across the board, you will find that organizations want to reduce people dependency. Correct. Put processes in place mm -hmm. which actually help enable the business mm -hmm. and move things along quickly. There is also the other side of it when processes become painful and actually paralyze mm -hmm. the, you know, from achieving the end objective. So it's a delicate balance. It's always a case of the solution is evolving. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's never a clear shut case that, okay, now we have done this. Now this will work for the next five years. It doesn't so happen. Like that. So we, I think people who are using the solution on a daily basis mm -hmm. do question this mm -hmm. every day. Mm -hmm. So for instance, what is CRM solving for me, right? One, it, it is bringing everything into one Correct. ecosystem. Correct. It is helping me understand what my revenue is going to look like in a month. Are there actionables which I need to take? Is there something we are missing out on? It helps, you know, bring that Correct. upfront rather than just depending on uh, the motivation levels or the sheer IQ yep. of a person, yep. right? And it keeps everybody on the same plane, right? So these ad tech solutions to my mind, right? And not just CRM. I mean, uh, CRM is just maybe a pipeline management to Correct. consumer uh, user management. Right. 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 Uh, any ad tech solution, as long as it is solving the core purpose, right? I think that's the base. Post that, you will always continue to evolve and have more expectations of the product. Correct. It can, okay, now... These are my immediate basic needs. Correct. You always start with that. You try out the of products. Course. And you say, okay, against the cost I'm paying for this or I'm building my own, this solves for me. Post that, you move into, there are other things that I do which is related to this process. Mm -hmm. Can everything get combined in one? Mm -hmm. Why do I need two ecosystems to work on? So, exactly. I think the holy grail is that you have a, like a one user experience where every part of the organization sort of is managed by one ecosystem. But we all know right. that uh, it's easier said than done. No, it doesn't really happen so much. Because everybody has a differentiator. Everybody is specialists. Yeah. There are specialists in certain line of orders, right? So, okay. On the same lines, how much of this reflection on assessing, reassessing ad tech tools that get used, either bought or built, how much of that comes from the bottom up? For example, your people saying, is there a better way? Can we look at a better way? Or, or and how much of that comes from the top down from the executive vision saying, let's consolidate our ad tech. Why are we, why do we have eight different systems? Yeah. Why is data being siloed in eight different things? By bringing all of them together, can we be more efficient? Can we drive more revenue? How much of it comes from the bottom? How much of it from the top? I think it works both ways, right? From the top, it comes from experience, right? So whenever somebody is building a new business, right? Mm. And they have built and operated a business at scale before. Mm. They know, okay, there are certain processes which need to be done in this way. Sure. And this is how departments will work each other so that this is a efficient system, correct, right? And it's a productive system. It's not, the costs are optimized. Mm. The costs are not disproportionate. Mm. It is not a big hit on the bottom line. Mm. So people with those experience, when they come in and set up a new business, right? They know this is how it eventually should look and maybe, you know, one step better than that. But at the start, you're solving for top line and scale. Right. So it is not priority one. Mm. Right? It's not priority zero. Priority zero is to get the business in, right? And... As you get the businesses, you learn the challenges you face, right? And then, let's say you have proof of pudding that, okay, this is, you know, and this is how it's going to taste and this is how it's going to work. Uh, then you start solving for reducing operational issues, mm. you know, for things to work more seamlessly. And then, then, you, then you actually see, okay, now that I have scale, I have a certain top line and bottom line I'm going to operate at. How much of this can I plonk back into developing tech or deploying ad tech solutions which make my team more productive Correct. and hence increase the both as a direct impact on the top line and bottom, bottom line. Yes. So 
for that the insights will actually come from people who are actually on the ground mm-hmm. and who are implementing the solutions mm-hmm. at the top then the counter view is that at the top you will also have much more view mm-hmm. or you know much better understanding of what is going to come in the future mm-hmm. in terms of product in terms of solutions in terms of uh, evolution of existing solutions so you are in a position where you can make a decision on okay now to enable all that to work seamlessly like it is working now i will need these solutions to come in as well okay. which bottoms up will not come right. right bottoms up you will perhaps get inputs mm-hmm. which are solving for uh, productivity and scale with existing relationships right right, right. so to answer your question in a Just short and simple way yeah. uh it is not independently top down or bottoms up correct okay. something uh it's a constant uh, amalgamation of both anything immediate and mission critical comes from the bottom up anything yeah. visionary forward looking comes from the top and it's a good problem to be solving right so yeah. i think the initial problem with uh, uh businesses is that will we achieve the scale yeah will we exist in the market five years down the line right so this is a good problem to be solving yeah. that is that is true yeah. and one funny question on the same uh, theme yeah is there is this saying that what can be automated should be automated what is the percentage of this application in your line of business in media sales in general has anything which can be automated automated already or is still there is scope and it's an evolutionary sort of iterative process the interesting interesting question i think uh, yes and no okay uh like i said there are bigger platforms which are in this space already they already know perhaps the they would have a compendium of say the 50000 questions which can come from you know within their ecosystem mm-hmm. in terms of operational challenges mm-hmm. and they are also thought leaders in that space right? so they already know everything that can possibly go wrong they have experienced it and told for the teeth right so when you are in that kind of a situation then you are already at a stage of business where say 80 90% of your stuff is automated mm-hmm. right it is just a matter of monic mm-hmm. right your your key differentiation what do you mean to the customer mm-hmm. right down to the level of what will get reported in what form mm-hmm. is already in place mm-hmm. so you can you can auto did evolve it interesting then then it brings another problem that as the ecosystem evolves how do you change such deeply entrenched processes right and with let's say the requirement of a fmcg brand versus suddenly crypto emerges hey they want different things right so that will be there then you look at the other side of uh, this whole business right where there are smaller uh platforms and people who are looking to scale up right or people who are in a different line of business and they have just started monetizing their app mm. right they will look at and expect things to be to happen in a very different way correct so honestly it is solving for that and uh, both sides uh, of the spectrum right right talking about innovation talking about technology productivity we spoke about and the industry itself come on mm. um, uh, commerce content uh, as well as advertising in the middle of it in the context and everything these industries are rapidly evolving especially yeah. since the pandemic during the pandemic it was completely different since then it has evolved so much personally speaking how do you we talk, also talked about thought leadership how do you stay updated about so many things in terms of strategies in terms of where money is getting spent ad budgets yeah. are getting spent in terms of technology innovation uh, in the sense of what do you attend events any any places where you go to meet okay. up people in your industry so there are some things i think which you do on the job okay. there are some things which you do in a formal manner okay for example if the whole world is talking about ai <laughs> do i get a ai certification from somewhere yeah. is it always the best yeah. or most applicable i don't think so right i look at certifications with a certain <laughs> bit of uh, skepticism if i am right yeah. uh at the same time i think as you grow in your roles and you start dealing with more people internally rather than your role being more external facing 
I think there is always a risk of not understanding what's happening on the ground, yeah. right? Yes. Uh, not understanding. So you come from a certain generation, certain value system, right? So uh, the the problem is that if you don't invest time with people who are younger than you, perhaps smarter than you, uh, there is always a risk of being out of touch. Correct. Right. So that is one thing I try to actively do, where. I talk to people, I experience platforms which they are using mm -hmm. rather than just sticking to what I do. Mm -hmm. So take the example of this, right? Uh, if I were a marketeer 10 years ago, mm -hmm. right? And I continued to persist with Facebook, right? And I did not even bother to create an account on Instagram. Yeah. Fact of the matter is five years down the line, I would have been out of touch with what is happening. Yeah. Right? If I had not gotten into uh, or bothered to at least understand what's happening on say a Twitter, or today Snapchat yeah. and so on, uh, then you are immediately out of it. So it does bring in the need from your own end to take owners and actually get out of your comfort zone and experience right. what uh, the next generation of people are doing, right? Uh, the third part from a networking standpoint, which I really enjoy is that you go to multiple events, uh, like something like which... Uh, the Global Fintech Fest, which happened in Bombay recently, or media events, or even advertiser events, some some events which your competition also does, right? So, uh, the idea is to understand where the whole ecosystem is going, right? Correct. It is not always about uh, building intelligence about what's what, or what's the next platform doing, right? It's also about understanding where the consumer needs are going. So, when you go, so for instance, for a big. Uh, point of learning for me when I attended a fintech fest mm -hmm. was that I didn't know these problems existed in the world mm -hmm. and this is something which needs to be actively solved for and suddenly mm -hmm. I saw that why AI is going to be so important in this space how and why suddenly there is going to be a huge loss of jobs let's say in that space right and mm -hmm. a lot of the stuff will just get automated and it will work efficiently so uh, that is what I try to do right. outside of this, right? Now, this solves uh, whatever I said till now sort of solves for the India context. Correct. Right? For globally, what's happening, uh, I mean, we, it's ironic we are you know, in the midst of a podcast and I'm talking of perhaps uh, other podcasts. So, uh, you tend to try to update your knowledge in your sphere and maybe even say other interests like politics or history yeah. uh, through uh, podcast. So the way I look at it is that it's, it's all about how much time you can invest, right? So if somebody who's worked 30 years on something mm -hmm. is talking about mm -hmm. and I listen to that person for 15 minutes, it's much uh, better than perhaps me listening to some audiobook mm -hmm. or reading 30 books on that subject. <laughs> the fact of the matter is most of us and maybe I won't be able to do that. Yeah. So like one podcast I really love is Pivot. Yeah. Uh, I think by, it's by the New York Magazine or something. And uh, Professor Galloway and uh, Scott Galloway, Professor Galloway and uh, Kara Swish. Kara Swish. Right. Now, when they talk about how this, uh, the consumer tech space and ad tech space is evolving, when they talk about privacy laws in the US and how that is affecting, uh, just as an example, uh, you know, how platforms operate in the US and Europe. It gives me an insight into perhaps how this will evolve into India. Correct. And the kind of problems we have to solve for in India will be very different because I understand the Indian context. Yes. So, uh, you do tend to, you know, invest time on such things. And uh, then out of all this, I think uh, one other thing which is really important is like people talk about taking rest, right, from work and getting off work. A lot of time gets invested in uh, content which is not related to my line of work, but still requires like a different part of the brain to be activated. Mm -hmm. So there is this uh, podcast called Empire, which mm -hmm. talks about the evolution of big empires yeah. and yeah. civilizations across the world, which I think William Dalrymple. Oh, right? Right? And this. So in that podcast, perhaps I learned about or how the East India Company came into India, you know, Turkish civilization, Byzantine Empire and whatnot. Things which I couldn't care less about <laughs> on a daily basis, but it activates a part of your brain which keeps you creatively 
inclined and hence you get, get better at your work is uh, what I eventually feel it leads to. Somewhere there is a correlation as well. Absolutely. Right, uh, from that. If it was at school in a social history class, I would have ran away from it. But right now, everything is contextual. And if you look at people, right, and especially as you grow older, uh, and perhaps hopefully wiser, right, what, what you tend to do is that you leave out passions out of work, right? So, one thing which I do consistently is that uh, I think for every year I have a different passion or obsession, right? So, one year I was fully into making cocktails and understanding that art. Uh, one year I was fully into coffee <laughs> and I wanted to know, taste, and, you know, get to know everything about coffee. And that stays with you, right? Because ultimately you have to uh, constantly push yourself to not just physically, but intellectually to right, right. reach a certain point right. of proficiency yeah. in different topics. So, right. that's what I try to do. That's the thing. So, I want to wrap up our conversation. So, I feel it has been extremely insightful to me. I'm sure the audience feels the same. Just to wrap up, um, talking about the digital ad space in India itself, yeah. where do you see some of, uh, at the very top of, I uh, don't mm -hmm. Say the bird's eye view. What are some of the challenges and opportunities you see right now, and probably end it with some predictions for the next five years? The challenges uh, are you know multifold, mm -hmm. to be honest, because uh, it's it's a it's a space in which you need to take risk, but you also need to take risk at a certain scale <laughs> to really understand whether it works for you or not as an advertiser. Right? You can't just and do innovation for the sake of innovation, right? So, I think initially people grappled with what to do with content and influencer marketing, mm. right? Today, mm. it is so mainstream that a lot of advertisers have their own in-house teams which are dedicated to that. Mm. It has become so important. Mm. So, to my mind, the challenge is that by the time a solution gets adopted, mm. right, and, uh, you know, reaches a certain scale, Till then, the next big thing has come. <laughs> yeah. And people are figuring out what to do with it, right? It happened with the metaverse and it didn't explode to the level it should have. But uh, similarly with content and influencer marketing. So that's one challenge, right? That uh, the evolution of technology and the kind of solutions which are coming into the market is super fast. Mm -hmm. And it's faster than the adoption. What they right? keep up. Uh -huh. So it's not a case where, you know, the maturity stage takes five years. Mm -hmm. It's much shorter. The life cycle, the product life cycle of the solution is actually much shorter, right? The second challenge is like you, which ties in with the first is that when you try something and when you figure out is this good for my business or not, measurement mm -hmm. and common measurement, mm -hmm. right? Third party verified measurement. Mm -hmm. That I feel is a challenge still. And reporting back, uh, like I said, insights, right? These are things which continue to be a challenge in this particular industry. But I feel we are getting there in terms of, uh, you know, people having a certain amount of trust. Because now we are not at that stage where people ask, okay, do we do digital or not? Now the question is, how do we scale digital? And how do we actually reduce dependency on other mediums? So uh, that's, I think, the second challenge. And uh, I think the third challenge is that uh, everybody is looking for that promised land, okay? Everybody feels that, wow, digital will come and change everything. And uh, the kind of expectations people had with this medium were, to my mind, a bit unrealistic, right? That the amount of targeting people go for and they feel which will work for them and uh, you know it is coming to a point where consumer privacy and solving for advertiser objectives within the realm of the law and compliance uh, is going to be a challenge going forward right and obviously user comes first right so you are you are seeing that happening in US and Europe where data privacy and people being able to, you know, stay off the grid Correct. will become an important right <laughs> for people going forward. So these are three challenges which the industry will continue to grapple with. 
and uh, integrate the last challenge i feel is more from a very operational standpoint and strategic standpoint as well because to my mind maybe everything will be digital okay so to my mind even tv or print will be digital in the future right mm mm-hmm. but this divide between offline versus online will fade yeah. and when that fades how do you do integrated planning mm. and how do you actually derive yeah. efficiency from this your business outcomes from this mm. will rapidly evolve but today mm. doing that while everybody knows it is right, right implementing it is a huge challenge because the metrics and measurement for both are not talking to each other correct okay so those are the challenges i feel and talking about opportunities right uh like i said within the digital ecosystem itself right and even within india i think quick commerce will uh, really scale connected tv is one space which will really uh where i think budgets between tv and uh, digital will sort of get realigned mm-hmm. and advertisers will understand the value of it as it scales right and it will not just be a okay this is the premium thing which i can buy it will be a core part of uh, you know tv buying as well right. going forward so that to my mind is a big opportunity which is i think then and very much here and now they we we can't really shy away from ai right <laughs> because if you look at programmatic advertising and let's say audio becoming available on programmatic out of home advertising getting available on programmatic ultimately you will need servers and ai ml to be able to process this amount much amount of data and actually optimize better because the load and expectation from these platforms uh, which on programmatic or self serve will continue to do so as a result to my mind this is a huge space which will really consolidate all marketing spends in the field right and so when uh, talking about ai while artificial intelligence some of it has been been used for example for example recommendation engine on netflix has always been that google search always has been youtube always been that but to see gen ai generative ai penetrate to let's say in the example of media sales yeah. they say uh, a client of mine has developed um an app where ops and sales people can in natural language can probe the data Hmm. instead of adding another metric and downloading a report and downloading in excel and using a bi tool to visualize it and then try to understand patterns you just say what is the relationship between these two yeah, and thing the okay i have a very contrasting view to the application of ai okay. uh, you know in stuff which we continue to do is that okay people feel that ai will make people dumber or it will make people you know less intellectual and less creative to my mind it's the opposite simply because it will challenge you yeah to be better than what a generated ai generative ai okay. version of you can think and implement rates so the levels of creativity right from content creation to how real time messaging changes when they are presented to consumers yeah from a brand uh, will actually you will have to become smarter that is true so it will actually i feel maybe push our race to become smarter as <laughs> as a whole right yeah. Yeah. so so yeah let's see where this goes though when right. any any predictions to close one particular thing you would see might happen then if five years in india in the india context it's a it's a slightly controversial one okay but uh, to my mind we are in an attention economy right and in social media is looked at with mixed feelings as of today it will not be a case earlier correct it is affecting people's uh, not directly i would say it is one of the contributors of mm. you know uh, mental health mm. uh, so to my mind or deterioration rather of mental health mm. so going forward i feel the current generation will actually move away if i have to say mm-hmm. towards uh, say move away from the social platforms mm. and maybe go into a space where of being off the grid and you know mm-hmm. off content and everything will become fashionable again mm-hmm. and we'll start to perhaps value nature more yeah while at the same time uh, how this will happen is that in our work life and when we are actually uh, 
you know, trying to solve for things which we do on a daily basis. Yeah. Technology will become so well ingrained that uh, we will have more time to yeah. think of yeah. what we are as humans and what we are here to achieve on this earth, right? So, let's see. I mean, it's a idealistic yeah. uh, take. Uh, but hopefully we are here to see what happens. I mean, optimism driven by technology, I think it's a... Uh... Yeah, I, I do feel that technology will not suddenly take over. It's not a Skynet situation, right? Like the Terminator and all. It's more of a... It's it's about uh, better integration into our daily lives. Have a wonderful note to close uh, our conversation. Rudrish, thank you so much. Thanks, Daish. It was very, very insightful and I hope... Uh, I know we took much more time than what we originally I, 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 I did for the pre-moment where I started coughing. Yeah. That's when I noticed time. But otherwise, it just flew by. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Antosh. And I really hope, uh, you know, things work out well and this podcast becomes like a super sought after one. Thank you. Thank you so much. I wish you and the team the very best from my end. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.